do these three things at the end. Okay. Where's the Tommy thing? Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all doing well on this kind of rainy afternoon. It's nice to have a little break in the weather. Uh, we got a couple of things to talk about today, of course, COVID. And we're going to talk about that first. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about cure violence and, and uh, how they're taking some applications. And then thirdly, we're going to hopefully we're going to try to answer some of your questions about voting on Tuesday. So uh, let me begin with the cure violence uh, numbers here. So um, yesterday, we uh, received notification of 175 positive cases in the city of St. Louis. Now, that is uh, receiving a dump of a whole bunch of cases that have happened over more than even the last two weeks. I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit because that's, I think that's the highest number of cases maybe that we've ever had. Uh, and it all has to do with um, how we're learning about cases from, uh, the cases are coming in from Quest and from LabCorp and, and from the state of Missouri. So uh, I'll come back and talk about that, but I think it's noteworthy to say that yesterday there were uh, 238 people that were in the hospital. That has been a really consistent number. In fact, it's looks like it's plateauing or maybe even going down a hair. Over the last two weeks, we've had a high in the hospital of 260, and we've had a low of 235, 213 on July 17th. So we're at 238 uh, yesterday. We were at 245 the day before, 243, 253. So uh, we're happy to say that the hospitalization numbers are not going up like the case counts are. The number of people in ICU yesterday was the same as the day before, which is 61. Uh, and that has increased a couple over the last week or so. Number of people uh, on ventilators, 27. And again, that's been a very consistent number. It's been 27 or 28 every day for the last week. Um, 38 people were admitted to the hospital, 49 were, were discharged. And you know that these hospital numbers run two days behind. So uh, that those are the numbers with regard to COVID. Now, let me talk just for a minute on this um, 175 cases that were reported to our health department yesterday. Um, you all know that across the country, Quest and LabCorp, the, primarily the two big labs are having real difficulty keeping up with the with processing the number of cases that uh, that are people are taking getting and uh, so that that is uh, made decision making about this especially difficult because in the last two weeks the city has received, notice of 1,218 new cases, if you just add up the new cases from July 17th through yesterday, that's two weeks. Uh, of those cases, uh, over 50% of them were over two weeks old. So that is the real difficulty in trying to figure out exactly what's happening day to day, which is why we continue to rely heavily on the hospitalization numbers. We do know that hospital hospitals easy for me to say, hospitalization lags, uh, but the test results are lagging also. So, um, so that is it with regard to COVID cases. Um, you know that it's our goal to continue to get 100% compliance with masks, 100% compliance with social distancing. Uh, if you're indoors, uh, you need to be wearing a mask, whether you're working somewhere or whether you're a customer or client somewhere, you need to be wearing a mask. What's the exception to that? If you're sitting down at a table actively eating uh, or drinking. Otherwise, I, just, I was just at lunch with a few people. Uh, we were sitting uh, in a covered outdoor sort of area because, you know, it's raining. And uh, so everyone was wearing their masks until our food arrived, took our masks off, ate lunch, 
as we, you know, we're getting up to leave when we we're finished with lunch, put the mask back on, said goodbye to one another and left. Um, that's an exception. And of course, we know that, that there are exceptions for people that have uh, certain medical conditions who can't wear a mask, but that's, that's not a common situation. So our goal is to get 100% um, mask compliance. You know that, what's today is the 31st. So on, it was on July the 3rd, so 27, 26, 27 days ago was when the mask order went into place. And um, we, we hope that we're beginning to see some stabilization from that effort. And um, so thanks to all of you who are wearing your masks, who are social distancing, uh, who are choosing outdoor dining when you can, who are um, ha keeping your gatherings small to the same small group of people. Um, that's, that's really important. And of course, um, we are continuing to see a number of the positive cases are among people that are under 40. So people primarily in their 20s and in their 30s. Um, and that's where our positive cases are coming from. The older folks like me and maybe many of you that are watching, we, we seem to have gotten the message and we're being careful because we know we're seeing every day that this is literally affecting every business. You see the Cardinals had to cancel their game today. Um, and so it, it isn't, um, it's not one business or one group or another, it's, it's, everybody's having the issue. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all for, for helping by wearing a mask, being socially distanced, washing your hands, etc. cetera. Um, that's all I have today on COVID. Uh, let's see here. So on Wednesday, I talked quite a lot about the violence that we're seeing in our community. We have so far in July, 53 homicides. I think that's, that's more than any month that I can ever remember. Uh, and it's way too many. We have 153 for so far for the year, so for seven months. Very high. There's a lot of stress, a lot of pain in our community. Uh, a lot of people se settling their differences with guns. A lot of running disputes between groups. And um, so that, of course, our police are working very hard to try to solve those crimes. But the other thing that's happening is cure violence is getting off the ground. It's already started. It started um, almost two months ago now in Wells Goodfellow. Uh, neighborhood, but it is now also starting in um, Walnut Park, which frankly have been where a lot of our, our murders are. This is a flyer. This is easy to find online. Uh, let me see if I can show it to you here. This is a cure violence flyer for the Walnut Park neighborhood, uh, trying to hire outreach workers, interrupters, and outreach supervisors. Uh, the phone number to call is 615-3600. This program in Walnut Park is being run by the Urban League. And um, then the second, uh, well, it's the third neighborhood, is the Dutchtown neighborhood. And this is its flyer right here. And this pro, this is all, they are also hiring for the Dutchtown neighborhood. And this uh, this neighborhood is being run by the um, Employment Connections. Sorry, escape me for a minute. And their phone number is 333-5639. So, um, you know, it, it, it is off the ground and uh, beginning, to, uh, beginning to be able to make a difference. So the third thing I guess that I want to visit with you about is that tomorrow, which is August 1st, um, the Urban League is having an Urban Expo starting at noon uh, on at, at the Urban League on Albert, which is uh, just one block uh, east, one block east of Kings Highway. So it's 1330 Albert Avenue. 
and its uh, food toiletries distribu distribution. So I wanted to let you know about those things. And um, I think those were the only subjects that I had on my mind. So hopefully have plenty of time today for your, for your questions. Do we have questions, Jacob? A couple questions. Um, question from Lindy asking, uh, has the health department considered uh, sending contact tracers out to bars and restaurants? Well, that's not quite the way it works, Lindy. Um, what, what we have done is sent uh, health inspectors and uh, liquor inspectors to bars and restaurants. So we are doing that uh, primarily on the weekends, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. We know those are the busy times. So we are doing that. We're doing it again this weekend. Contact tracers would mean that uh, somebody's positive and then they're going to you know, ask me if I were the one positive. I'm not, by the way, but if I were, they would then ask me, well, who have you been with for the last uh, 14 days <clears throat> or since the last time I was at work, say, and who have you been with for more than 10 minutes without wearing a mask and without social distancing? That's the um, highest possibility of exposure. If you're, if you're not socially distanced and you're not wearing a mask and you were with somebody for 10 minutes, not just walking by them on the sidewalk generally, but if you were with them for some period of time, then you have a higher chance of having contracted the virus. So they don't do that at bars, even though that might be where someone picked it up. But we are, we do have inspectors out in bars. A uh, question from Abby about enforcement of businesses. What do you feel like the reaction has been like so far? Do you think it's being effective and do you intend to continue with your more targeted approach to enforcing businesses? You know, we do intend to continue with a more targeted approach because um, for those businesses, and, and it's most of them, that are doing a good job of enforcing mask wearing and social distancing, uh, we're trying not to, uh, to, to shut them down or to curtail them if they're doing a good job. Um, and I frankly, I think every single business wants to do a good job. There's nobody out there that's just as like, well, I'm just not going to do it. That, that's not the case. The case is that it's hard, and it's especially hard to enforce masks and social distancing if you are in a big group of people, such as at a nightclub. It's very, very hard to do that. But it is what has to happen if the business is going to be able to continue to operate. And they need to probably make some operational changes as well. So yes, we are hoping to continue with that targeted approach. Um, An awful lot of businesses that I've spoken with, and I've, I've spoken with a, quite a few, have already made adjustments. There are businesses that might normally have stayed open till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, but they're closing at 10 or 11 now because they know that the later it gets, the harder it is. And um, nobody wants to be, uh, nobody wants to spread this. And uh, so a lot of uh, businesses are, have already made a lot of adjustments and um, we thank them for that. Question from Sarah Mayer. So uh, the state of Missouri was listed by the White House as a red zone and they recommend that bars and restaurants and close if the positivity rate is 10 percent. Mm -hmm. Is the city taking federal government's recommendations into account? We, sir, we are taking them into account. Our positivity rate right now is running at about 8 to 8.4, 8.5 percent. Um, and what you probably noticed if you read all that information that came out from the White House is that you know, some of the places in Missouri that are really um, having big increase in cases and, and uh, positivity rates are in rural Missouri, Branson, and I, I can't remember all of the locations. But, um, you know, so this isn't just a St. Louis uh, and St. Louis County issue. This is across the state. And, um, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can in order to stop the, the spread. 
So on a couple of other topics, we got a question from Jason and asks, what is the city of St. Louis to make, doing to make sure that voting will be safe for people who are voting in person on Tuesday? Right. Well, thank you, Jason, for that. Well, first of all, I hope everybody goes and votes on Tuesday. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the fundamentals of our democracy. So go vote on Tuesday. Polls open at 6 a.m. They close at 7 p.m. Uh, there are 99 different polling places in the city of St. Louis. If you, for those of you who, who are vote, regular voters, you know you got a card in the mail that said, that reminds you uh, that Tuesday's election day. Usually that's a white card. The one I got is a little, I don't know, three by five card, I guess, telling me where I vote. I vote. I voted in the same place for the last 32 years, so I know how to get there. Uh, but some polling places have changed, and they've changed for a few reasons. Uh, ADA reasons, making sure they're accessible. In some some places, they've changed because of COVID, because um, you know, they were in locations where you didn't want a lot of people walking in. If your polling place changed, your little three by five card is yellow. So that's, you know, take a look at that. Just recognize that as something different than what you usually get and then find your polling place. When you do find your polling place, you'll find uh, six foot distancing, you know, marks on the, on the ground. You have to wear a mask to go in to vote. Um, if for some reason you can't wear a mask, let's say because of a health reason, the, uh, you will be voted at your car. They call it car side voting or something. So, so uh, election uh, poll workers can come to the side of your car if you're there and you're unable to wear a mask into the polling place. So the goal is to get everybody to be able to vote. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Oh, there's hand sanitizers there. Sanitizer there. Um, what else should I mention? They have Q-tips if you want to use the touch screen. Oh yeah, if you're using a touch screen, they do. They've got you know little Q-tips that you can use, so that you're not using your finger to do they have the touch a floor screen. Marked six feet for lines. Right, so. floors marked, uh, hand sanitizers there, um, and so just please do go vote. Recognize that voting in person will be a little different now. I know that there are folks that are very worried that they're doing the mail-in ballot and you know in some in my neighborhood for example I see the there's a Google group and people are, are posting on there you know haven't gotten my mail in a couple days well you know the post office is they're struggling and so if you're worried that your mail-in ballot is not going to get there number one today's Friday it should get there by Tuesday Take it to the main post office. I know that's an inconvenience, but if, you, if you're worried about it getting there, take it to the main post office. I would get it there pretty soon so that it has to be at the election board uh, on Tuesday. It can't be later than Tuesday. The other thing about mail-in ballot, where is that information, Jacob? There we go. So we just talked to the election board about this. And I want to make sure I get this right for you. So if you, if you feel like your mail-in ballot is not going to get there, so let's say you haven't mailed it yet, you don't mail it tomorrow, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can take your mail-in ballot to the election board and vote absentee. So everybody only gets one ballot. So then you would have to take it in, they would destroy that, and then you'd vote absentee. That's till Monday at five o'clock. The other thing that you can do is, I understand that if you have a mail-in ballot, but you haven't filled it out and mailed it, on Tuesday you actually can go to your regular polling place and vote, but only if you bring that mail-in ballot with you. So, because they can't, they can't have more than one ballot out to you. So it's a little bit confusing, but um, if you've got your mail-in ballot sitting there, I would get it in the mail. PDQ. You all uh, know what that means, PDQ? 
I know the pretty young people. Pretty dang quick. Pretty darn quick. That's right. Get it in pretty darn quick. PDQ. A uh, couple other questions before we still have time, Mayor. Uh, Kyle is watching and asked, um, since cure violence had been implemented in Hamilton Heights, Wells Goodfellow, can you speak to whether or not there has been a decrease in crime or what kind of impact they've had in that neighborhood? So Kyle, at this point, it's anecdotal, um, where uh, Employment Connection has reported that they have made several interventions that they feel has prevented uh, a shooting or prevented uh, retaliation and violence. It's not long enough to a long enough period of time to really measure anything that's statistically uh, accurate. But anecdotally, they feel like it is making a difference. Rachel's watching and has a question about schools. Have you encouraged them? And I think that they did make this decision, but your position on schools going all virtual uh, come fall in the city of St. Louis. So we talked about this a lot on Wednesday, Rachel. Uh, St. Louis Public Schools made the announcement, I think it was Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, that they are going all virtual. Now, <clears throat> what that means is that uh, every kid will get, if they're an eighth grader under, they're going to get an iPad and a hotspot, or, or maybe it's a Chromebook and a hotspot. High school kids will get uh, Dell computers, and they will work from home on the same curriculum. But we also know that, I'm kind of looking for my notes from the other day, but because I'll botch the name of this, maybe. Here, here it is. So we also know that 35% of the families in St. Louis Public Schools uh, didn't want to do virtual. They wanted to go to school. Now, they're not going to have school, per se, but what they are going to have are instructional support centers. Those were the words I was looking for. In order to lend tech support to, to kids and to families, food, supervision, tutoring, help with your homework, um, and they will be, uh, there will be teachers, tutors, assistants there in order to help folks, and that will be at, at uh, school. So, but you still will be doing virtual learning, the same learning platforms that um, the kids that are, that are doing it all from home, so. Okay, last three questions of the day, Mayor, back to COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, Trisha's question has to do with masks. What about companies that are not public-facing companies and not open to the public? Are masks still mandatory for employees? Yes, they are. Jerry's question also about masks. Can you please share or remind us what the medical exemptions are, with example, for people who do, don't have to wear a mask? Um, someone who's on oxygen, perhaps. Someone who has bad asthma. It's generally respiratory um, medical issues that make it difficult or, or not possible for someone to wear a mask. And then the final question for today, Megan's question. If someone tests positive of COVID, do they get a phone call from the testing agency, the lab, or is it on the patient to call the health department to verify their results? No, wherever, wherever you had your test taken, whether it was in a hospital, whether it was uh, at a federally qualified health center, that medical spot will notify you of your test results, just like any medical test result that you would have. Uh, now, I have heard some people, you know, you're anxious to get your test, and I know that people do call, and sometimes they call, and the test is, uh, information is available to the to patient, but it's my understanding that, that within a few hours, everybody contacts the patient. They also then are reported to the state and the public health department, more or less simultaneously. That's all our questions for today, Mary. That's all? Good. 2.30. 2.30 already. So um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Everybody have a great weekend. Have a safe weekend. And um, thanks to everybody who's wearing their mask and, and trying to tamp down the spread of COVID. Appreciate you.